fantastic way to start off our summit. Um, that was a, that Rex is sure is a powerhouse and you know we don't like wallflowers at the podium and so we certainly got our money's worth from him. Um, of course today I just wanted to acknowledge again that it is uh, the tribute to Ralph Klein and I know that we have a number of our attendees who are attending that memorial today and so who weren't able to be here. The great thing about this though is that we do have um, 200,000 people that subscribe to our YouTube channel so we are recording all of these presentations um, even the people that are, are missing them will be able to see them. We're going to jump right in uh, to the first uh, theme here which is Atlas Speaks, our shared activity anxiety that capital is being chased away. And the reason why we chose this theme for those uh, Ayn Rand uh, followers in the audience who have read Atlas Shrugged, there really comes a point in our society where the, the guys and gals that are really driving wealth creation get so frustrated with uh, the challenges and the barriers in order to, uh, to create cross prosperity and jobs and, and be entrepreneurs that of course in her book Atlas Shrug eventually they just gave up and went away. So we said okay before they give up and go away we're going to give them an opportunity to speak. Our first um, and just we're getting into our first session here. These, these sessions are just going to be 20 minutes long to A, keep you, uh, 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 keep your attention as well as to keep the attention of our, our 200,000 subscribers on YouTube. So if any of you have watched TED Talks before, um, that's, the, that's the style which we're getting into today. So I am thrilled that Jim Davidson, the chairman and CEO of First Energy Capital, has agreed to speak today. I've known Jim for about 10 years. Um, we have uh, participated in a number of conferences together. He's a big ideas guy. He's very passionate about business and also the ideas that support um, business and, and creativity and, uh, and wealth and prosperity. I'm, I'm a policy geek, um, and so I can now, I admit that, and, and, I, uh, and, I, and I, I don't think that that's a bad term. And I have a lot of friends who are policy geeks, and we spend a lot of time sitting around talking about policy and being geeky. So I believe really strongly that it's important um, to not only have policy geeks talking about uh, about ideas, but to get the business guys themselves telling us their real life case studies, the stories from the front line, and uh, Jim Davidson is one of those who has uh, certainly always shown courage to do that. And he's one of the guys in the chain uh, that Rex was talking about this morning, putting the deals together and making sure that uh, that industry here is thriving. So he's going to talk about uh, capital, about uh, about opportunities. Uh, some of the challenges that we're having and, uh, and how, what we need to do to, uh, to do a few more deals here in town. Please join me in welcoming Jim Davidson. Oh, I think it'll just go automatically. So, oh, it does? Yeah. Okay. okay. Good morning. Can everybody hear me out there? Great. Uh, I've been charged with the responsibility today to talk about redirecting the tap, why capital has left and how to get it back within Alberta. And I am going to touch on, in my speech, um, the 2007 royalty review changes that came about as a precedent of why capital uh, is fluid, how it was demonstrated very, very uh, dramatically to us, and how we have moved away from that and attempted to get capital back into Alberta. So when it comes to Canada, Alberta may have won the lottery, well at least in respect to our natural resources, and specifically to our abundance of oil and gas reserves, which in turn affords Alberta diverse economic opportunities. But this lottery win does not give us the right to gamble away our riches by naive policies or actions by our elected officials. We know that statistically gambling does not result in consistent wins. Nowhere have the consequences of high risk gambling been more evident than demonstrated by Premier Stelmack and the Alberta government in 2007 during the royalty review. The ramifications of such gambling behavior align with all gamblers miscalculations. It starts with overconfidence. They don't see what could go wrong or the cost required to repair the damage caused. 
The result of these gambling blunders are others have to pick up the pieces, become more fiscally responsible, and reduce their risk tolerance. But most damaging of all is their need to rebuild trust to all those who are adversely affected by someone else's poor or misinformed decision. This is exactly what Alberta citizens, companies and investors have faced in recent years. Now everyone has to work harder to drive capital and investment into Alberta. Alberta requires capital investment develop its rich reserves, but the flow of investment has wavered in recent years and to get it flowing again, we need to understand some history as to why the taps of capital investment were tightened. The consequences of the decisions made, as well as the lessons learned before, we can discuss the path forward to ensure a, a strong and vibrant investment environment. In the last decade, the Alberta government, led by Premier Stelmack and now Premier Redford, either forgot or chose to forget a few important considerations that any good gambler knows. Unless you can control all the variables, both now and in the fu future, you cannot predict the outcome. For example, the one constant about commodities is that prices vary, and determining budgets based on the best case scenarios is a dangerous undertaking. Likewise, oil and gas reserves are not contained solely within Alberta's borders, so other provinces may make investing in their region more favorable. In 2008, it is unlikely that anyone in our government predicted the global economic crisis and its impact on the price of oil, the demand for oil, or most importantly, the confidence or ability to invest in Alberta. It is unlikely that anyone recognized the impact of Alberta's strength in technological advancement for oil and gas capture, specifically referring to the fracking and multi-bore drilling that has led to improved efficiencies in oil and gas exploration and production. These advancements have also resulted in targeting challenging formations in ever more complex geology. Our technology advancements would in part contributed to supply and demand issues that have resulted in downward pressures on prices. Prices lower than the government predicted in its budgets. Today, speed plays an important role in capital investment into Alberta. We live in a world where information exchange is instant and market conditions can be conveyed via mobile, mobile devices. Speed of technological advancement is also allowing for monthly improvements in drilling efficiencies. The reduced time it takes to drill a well and the increased output from each well is a result of improvements in hydraulic fracking. But if the governments are not reacting with speed or changing with variable market conditions, capital will flow away. Like any other liquid, it will go to the point of least resistance. If Alberta's current finance minister, Doug Horner, can be quoted stating that our budget deficit is in large part due to a bottleneck in transporting oil, what foresight did they have on ensuring the problems did not occur and how are they adjusting spending and attracting capital knowing this problem will take years to fix? It is also unlikely that anyone accurately forecast how the technology advancements that would increase Alberta's oil and gas, gas extraction capability would also reach beyond our borders to Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and BC, and provide significant benefits to their provinces. One would hazard to guess that the royalty regime adjustments were conceived, that when the royalty regime adjustments were conceived and put into place in 2007, that anyone truly calculated what any basic economic class would teach. Technology was changing the landscape. If supply goes up, it would cause pressure on prices, and if new or expanded markets could not absorb the increased supply, prices will decrease. The profitability of production is thus affected, and the desire to invest capital or resources is also diminished. All these factors play were in play and caused pressure on Alberta capital investment without taking into account increases in taxation on Alberta production via the change to royalty rates. Let's dial back to Stelmax royalty changes and their governance during this time. It has been suggested that in 2007, Stelmax killed plans for seismic testing 
to determine the feasibility of bitumen recovery at Marie Lake. It not only interfered with a testing site without cause, but went against its own legislation. It also caused concern for future investors regarding good governance and was also an indicator of what was to come. Stelmack then went on to calculate that Alberta's main economic driver, the oil industry, could pay another $1.4 billion annually in royalties. He assumed this push would not deter the market hit already by low natural gas prices, high service costs, and ever-increasing labor costs. Did the Stelmack government really believe capital would not pick up and move to friendlier grounds with stable government and consistent practices and policies. To understand the impact of this lack of foresight, here are some examples. The combination of Canada's lowest tax rates, smallest government, and most attractive investment environment has been referred to as the Alberta advantage. But cracks began to appear as a result of our fair share. Premier Stelmack liked to talk about our fair share, so it seems fair to look at what at the share of Western Canadian spending and activity that Alberta received during the period of the royalty review. How did this affect the activity in Western Canadian sedimentary basin? What happened to Alberta land sales? First Energy believes, all else equal, that Alberta land sales would have been $2.3 billion higher in 2008 if Alberta had received its usual 70% of the total land bonus spending in Western Canada. Instead, Alberta's land bonuses fell in 2008 to 24% of the total dollar spent in Western Canada. It also appears that the Royalty Review cut the amount of acres purchased by 15%. This equates to producers not taking up a million acres that they otherwise would have. It should be noted that as the damage caused is now unwound, producers are coming back to the province. During that time frame, the new royalty framework resulted in Alberta getting the lowest share of conventional oil and gas spending in 40 years. Using meters drilled, Alberta's drilling volumes dropped by 65% from 2006 to 2009. In the rest of Western Canada, the meters drilled dropped by only 22% over the same period. This decrease in capital spending was not isolated to the oil and gas industry, but extended to the oil and gas service industry and created a multiplier effect reducing demand for goods and services throughout the supply chain. It was not that demand for oil was eliminated, but rather investors looked elsewhere and did not reinvest their cash back into our market. Where was the greatest impact felt? Looking at conventional non-oil sands CapEx programs, spending in the basin went from $36 billion in 2006 to $20 billion in 2009, a drop of 44%. In Alberta, spending was cut because there was simply less cash to invest. Producers went from reinvesting 72% of their available cash back into Alberta in 2006 to investing only 56% 56 in 2009. Had producers put 72% of their available cash back into Alberta as they had in 2006, conventional oil and gas spending in Alberta would have been 29% higher, leaving $3.4 billion on the table. The Alberta advantage was shrinking. In recent years, Alberta has not had any meaningful tax relief for investors. These actions contrast that of, to that of Saskatchewan and the BC governments whom have developed and permitted tax relief, which in turn has narrowed the tax gap. BC and Saskatchewan have also reduced personal income tax and phased out the general corporate capital tax. This further reduced the Alberta advantage who until that point had been the only province without a corporate capital tax. This lack of insight was not, has not improved dramatically since 2007. Earlier this year, our government announced a shortfall and made a budget miscalculation. 
Finance Minister Horner reported natural resource revenues were $2.4 billion lower than anticipated in the first nine months of the fiscal year, a resounding drop of, four, of 30 percent. However, we're living in the Wild West, well, at least when it comes to spending. The last two Alberta governments have chosen to continue to spend rather than embrace the opportunity to strengthen Alberta's diminishing tax advantage. As a result, this year the province is now forecasting a deficit of between three and a half to four billion dollars, quadruple the $886 million deficit predicted in Premier Alison Redford's pre-election budget. The spending spree continues with an 85% drawdown of the sustainability fund since 2008. The government had choices on how to manage royalty revenues and create stability. Alberta Heritage Savings Trust Fund at inception in 1976 had three objectives, to save for the future, to strengthen or diversify the economy, and to improve the quality of life of all Albertans. The fund aimed to manage and invest the savings from Alberta's vast non-renewable resources and to provide the greatest financial return on those savings for current and future generations. In 1997, the Heritage Trust Fund was restructured so that it could no longer be used by the government for direct economic development or social investment purposes. Poor stewardship. The revenues were put in the fund but just as quickly pulled out. From 1997 to 2011, the cumulative net income for the fund was 31 billion, yet almost 30 billion was transferred out by legislation, meaning virtually nothing was left for inflation proofing or to keep the principal intact in real terms. Moving forward, a possible and proven solution is to follow other models such as Alaska and Norway by putting resource revenues con consistently into a fund and using only the income from the fund for current spending. The Alaskan fund worth 40 billion in 2011 provides dividends to eligible residents in turn creating a policing mechanism as residents monitor cash flows in and out of the fund. In Norway, all net proceeds from petroleum activity go into the fund and the government does not touch the principle. Had Alberta practiced the same discipline as Alaska, contributing 25% of its non-renewable resource revenues from 1982 to 2011, the contributions would have been $42 billion versus the actual contributions by Alberta of just over $9 billion. The difference is even greater when compared to Norway. Using their model, total contributions in the same period would have been $170 billion versus $9 billion. The ramifications of this differential are significant, suggestion, suggesting the fact that maybe the 2070, 2007 royalty changes could have been avoided and the capital would not only stayed in Alberta but flourished. Now let's dial forward. Looking at the landscape today, transportation is playing a big role in investing in Alberta. Canadian upstream gross revenues are approximately $100 billion per year. Western Canadian crude trades at a $30 discount to Brent pricing, so costing us top line over $90 million a day. The cost to Albertans, Canadians and investors is estimated at $33 billion per year through discounted pricing and lost tax revenues. Government and investors need to make sure they are getting the best possible dollar for our non-renewable resources. Increasing pipeline and rail capacity not only moves more oil, but pipelines also encourage capital into the Alberta market. Pipeline investment itself adds capital and in any improvement in net backs brought about by pipelines will likely be reinvested back into our province. Rail is another means to encourage capital back to Alberta. It is expected by the year end, $250 million in capital will be invested in Western Canada facilities to load rail, crude oil onto rail cars. Rail is a short-term alternative or complement to pipeline transport 
Alberta rail service suppliers believe that crude by rail exports out of Canada could be as high as 250,000 barrels per day by next year. This is the equivalent of a major pipeline. What are the alternatives to transport, infra transport infrastructure to drive capital? Increased refinery capacity has been suggested, but this does not appear to be occurring. Interest in using capital for increased refinery capacity appears to be tapering off from 2007 when $6.6 billion was invested. If Alberta wants more upgrading capacity, it will only come at a high cost. What can be done to decrease the current bottleneck of transporting resources out of Alberta, and how would this encourage capital to flow into Alberta? For the most part, the government has done what it can in regard to transportation capacity, but together with pipeline companies, there is an opportunity to improve their regulatory and public affairs departments so the concerns of environmental groups and First Nations are foreseen and addressed at earlier state phases of the planning process. This engagement would result in a greater understanding regarding the requirement for the project as well as an outline of project parameters resulting in diminished pushback from the special interest groups. For buy-in and approval of emotionally or politically charged projects, companies must work consistently and patiently in order to get community approval for their projects. The people are smart and they accept change or risk where there's no other option or if it results in a personal net benefit. For example, if the people in the coastal BC had no energy supply, they would evaluate the Northern Gateway pipeline very differently. But they have energy supply, so for the project to proceed, there must be a perceived benefit to them. Thus moving forward, industry and government will need to find solutions to make the project viable while ensuring environmental risks are minimized for, con for concerned parties. As Albertans and Canadians we, and Canadians, we must recognize that in the foreseeable future, the U.S. will remain our primary customer. As our number one customer, the U.S. will watch over us and scrutinize our policy, pricing, and environmental responsibility, especially with respect to the oil spans. As with all clients, we must work to foster the relationship and keep our number one customer happy, working with them while not bending to their every request. The proposed Keystone Pipeline, along with expanded transport of crude by rail, are our like, most likely means to decrease the current bottlenecks in the short term. Now the good news. Alberta consistently has the highest investment per capita ratio in Canada, at almost double the Canadian average. Reported capital investment intentions in Alberta increased 40% over the national level. Total capital investment in Alberta is expected to reach 100 billion this year, which is a record high, but at a 2.4% growth, an indicator of slowdown in activity and a smallage, smallest percentage increase in years. Nationally, the total planned investment across the country is expected to rise 1.7% to just under 400 billion. This indicates Alberta continues to outpace the national average and now accounts for more than a quarter of total activity across the country. How do we open the investment tap without gambling away our future security? We need to reduce barriers to investment. The Fraser Institute during a uh, global petroleum survey in 2008 discovered that even Saskatchewan had a more favorable investment landscape when compared to Alberta, and that was at a time when the NDP government was in power compared to the current Saskatchewan party, which is far more business friendly. Another component of this global petroleum survey was ranking based on a parameter called the Regulatory Climate Index, and Alberta was perceived as a higher barrier to entry than its neighbor Saskatchewan. If Alberta is going to drive and sustain capital investment, government regulations and regulatory uncertainty must be minimized. Environmental regulations must be fair and safe to producers. 
provincial and federal trade regula regulation must work with companies, not against them. Labor restrictions and employment agreements must align with other producing provinces. Currently, the cost of compliance in Alberta is not deemed higher than other countries, but is higher than neighboring provinces. The most recent 18 question annual survey conducted by the Fraser Institute in April 2012 looked at investment barriers globally for investment in upstream oil and gas exploration. In 2009, following the royalty changes, Alberta was perceived to have the highest level of investment barriers across Canada. In 2012, our ranking has risen to third most favorable investment, but still behind Manitoba and Saskatchewan. In 2009, Alberta was considered 92nd best place to do business out of 140 jurisdictions globally. That is a stunning statistic. But by last year, it has risen back to 21st. This improved performance is due to the commercial environment, but more significantly perceived reductions in the cost of regulation and the uncertainty and risk of doing business in Alberta. These survey results indicate investors will favor provinces where uncertainty to regulatory administration is minimized, as well as give preference to locations where efficiencies are achieved regarding consistency in policy and procedure. Investors face enough economic uncertainty without the need for onerous, complicated, or changing compliance. The Alberta Energy and Utilities Board must ensure they are efficient in their response to application for exploration and producing drilling approvals. To minimize the lost revenues by selling Western Canadian crude at a discount to the US, we must investigate viable solutions to export large volumes off of our coasts, both of them, over the next decade and beyond. Alberta must market itself and demonstrate its political stability. We need to rebuild trust with our investors. We need to both attract and retain capital as investors have long memories. The Alberta government, companies, and prospective investors must work consistently and reasonably with First Nations groups, including respecting their native land claims and working towards compromise and win-win situations. There are signs that the Premier is looking for more enduring solutions to the province's challenges. But we need to restore our credibility as a responsible environmental steward and use the market forces to drive the innovation needed. Restoring the oil sands sector's diminished and environmental standing in markets south of the border and overseas will deliver both environmental and economic benefits. It would capture the attention and respect of the world. We need to ensure that we have a skilled workforce with competitive labor rates. Now, Alberta was built on cowboy ethics, rules that talk about fairness, respect, hard work, integrity, and trust. We not only need our core values to remain strong, but we must ensure investors into Alberta see these characteristics as valuable attributes, reinforcing how their investment into Alberta will be safe and respected. The Alberta government needs to demonstrate fiscal responsibility and discipline in its spending. This may result in tightening of purse strings while ensuring Albertans that any short-term pain will result in long-term gain. Interesting that I have this paragraph in here on, on the day of Ralph Klein's funeral. With the various levels of government collecting 50% of revenues from oil and gas production, they need to save and manage those funds wisely for our economic stability and for future generations. The government needs to implement conservative price predictions on forecasted price for oil and natural gas and not budget on optimistic revenue estimates. We, Albertans, should raise our expectations 
regarding the delivery of important information, including annual budgets. Social media is driving demand for higher levels of transparency and accountability. Albertans should demand no less from their government. In conclusion, the capital investment tap is on and flowing back into Alberta with a steady stream. But as Albertans, we must demand that government be fiscally responsible and recognize that decisions like that of Stelmac's fair share royalty changes showcased the flexibility and the fluidity of money and how quickly it can be diverted or dry up. Alberta has a good shot at doubling oil and gas revenues over the next decade, but it will take very good access to the capital markets to do that. And we must again recognize capital has a long memory. Capital can and will leave. Likewise, consistency of policy and building trust will help to stabilize and encourage long-term investment. We must create a positive, stable investment climate. Thank you.